I'd like to talk about, uh, you know, some plays lead you in a different direction. Um, do you sense there's a shift coming in your work or has it happened? And if so, can you pin it on any particular play? Sure. Uh, I feel like I'm shifting all the time. I mean, I was talking earlier about Tempting Providence and that was a huge, huge shift for me. Um, I guess what I feel is shifting and has to shift uh, is my relationship to work. Um, I had a couple of things happen in the last couple of years that were uh, really interesting and that uh, eye-opening for me on a personal level, uh, with particularly with Oil and Water. And, you know, Oil and Water was the show that um, Oil and Water was a show based upon the story of Lanier Phillips that you know I, I heard um, many many years ago, 1997, and I, I always wanted to write into a play and write it write it into something. And it took many many years for it to actually happen. Um, so living with a story that I, I was interested in telling for so long, and then finally doing it and 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 getting it up on stage was. Um, Can you just tell us a little bit about sure, the story? Sure, Because not everyone may not be familiar sure. Sure, uh, Lanier Phillips was. Um, uh, he just passed away last year. Lanier Phillips was uh, uh, um, the only African American survivor of a shipwreck, the USS Truxton, uh, on the south coast of Newfoundland in 1942, uh, and he had grown up in a, a, a really racist environment. Um, in in, um, in Georgia, outside Atlanta, um, and had joined the Navy to kind of escape uh, the influence of the Klan. The Klan had burned down his elementary school. Like he had a really, you know, he was in a hard place uh, as most people of his race were at that time and place. And so he had joined the Navy to try to escape that and then found once he got in the Navy, it was really not much better in the Navy. Uh, and then he was in the shipwreck. He was the only person of color to survive that event. Um, all of the survivors of that event uh, who, who made it to shore ended up being covered in thick black bilge oil that was being uh, seeped from the wreck as it was being bashed on the rocks. And so um, as Lanier, who had been grown, raised and, and taught to, to uh, mistrust and fear and, and hate white people, with probably great reason, um, was, you know, as he was rescued and brought to shore in this very remote and very, the town of St. Lawrence, very remote, completely white town, uh, he woke up on a bed uh, rescued uh, with these two white women washing him, washing the oil off his body, uh, terrified, you know, uh, that he was going to be hung, lynched for this. Um, and uh, then the woman, Violet Pike, who was washing the oil off of his body, uh, made a comment that she couldn't get it to come off. And then they realized that he that she thought the color of his skin was the oil. And he had to actually say, that's the color of my skin. And she had never seen a black person before. It was a very isolated part of Newfoundland. Um, and then not sure what that was going to mean to this woman. Uh, what, you know, would they kill him now? And, and, and she said, oh, sorry about that. And took him to his, her house, her and her husband, John's house, and put him up for two days while the Navy, before the Navy came to rescue the, the survivors. And that had a tr tremendous uh, impact on Lanier's life. He ended up going back to the States and becoming a civil rights activist. He was so moved and transformed by um, this awakening that, that racism could be, um, could be a, a taught phenomenon, not something that was innate, innately natural, as he had been raised to believe. So after he went back to the, the, the States, uh, Lanier was greatly transformed by this experience. It caused a real kind of shift in him, and um, he realized that... Uh, profound realization that racism could be something that is actually taught and not innate as he had been raised to believe as he his entire world experience worldview was that that racism is innate um and in later in his life he became uh, he started telling the story and uh, more and more and, and and grew to a certain level of fame because of it uh and and as a result he became um completely unconscious, unconsciously, not, not his intention at all, he became uh, a kind of much needed champion of Newfoundland and Labrador, um, which is, was profoundly moving to me that this guy who had spent two days here, uh, you know, 70 years ago, um, could talk about this place that um, certainly within my lifetime has been much maligned and misunderstood and talk about it in such clarity and see it in a way that I had already always seen it and that I had been grown up to see it. I had grown up to see it. Um, that that just moved me a lot. So I, I, you know, that's why that story um, touched me and I wanted to tell it. So doing that show, um, 
and going through the process of getting, you know, and, and just and just the fears surrounding uh, the notions of appropriation of voice and writing black characters and and my rights surrounding that and, and all of that stuff, moving through that process and all the fear and anxiety surrounding that and getting it to a place where it goes up on stage finally in St. John's and the entire run sells out before we open. You can't get a ticket to see this thing. And then Lanier's daughter is coming to see it from, from Atlanta and a bunch of the, the survivors, from the, the, the surviving rescuers from, from St. Lawrence are coming to see it. An opening night happens and it's an amazing thing. It's an amazing, successful thing. And people are standing up and CBC television are doing interviews with me about the show closing. Mm -hmm. Like we can't get an interview about, you know, I did three interviews with CBC television about that show. One of which was the show closing. <laughs> it's incredible to me. It was a huge, huge, huge splash. And in the middle of it, I hit this profound um, depression. I just got really depressed <laughs> in the middle of it, and I didn't understand why. Uh, I couldn't understand why, and I spent most of the uh, remaining run of the production trying to figure out why I was depressed. And then somewhere around towards the end of the show, the end of the two-week run, I realized that it was because, you know, I just won the Governor General's Award two or three months before this, and now I had this show, that I, this story that I always loved, and I strained to get right and went up and all the right people liked it. Most importantly, the people who were actually portrayed and liked it, and it was this big hit. And all of a sudden, this hole that I uh, felt in my life, uh, in my person, that uh, I always assumed could be filled with work, <laughs> uh, wasn't. Uh, I had this level of success suddenly, and it wasn't doing it. Wow, it was depressing. And uh, so what did I do about that? I, uh, I, I, you know, I talked to a couple people about it and then I did nothing. Uh, because, you know, people started, the show started to get picked up on the mainland and, and so it was going to happen next year and it was going to grow. And, and so I didn't do anything about it. And that year the show got published, the play got published, and I kind of forgot about that moment. And uh, the play got published and then uh, I was about to head off to go to school in uh, Toronto again and I get a call from the publisher one day and I'd completely gotten over this and I was fine. I had a call from the publisher one day and they told me that due to a clerical error, um, completely understandable clerical error, the person felt really awful about it, the, the play, the published play didn't get submitted for the Governor General's Award, um, which is, you know, it's, it, it's too bad and it's, it would upset any playwright. It devastated me and that depression was back in a really big way and I sunk into it for about three weeks. And I recognized it in about week two, I recognized this is that depression <laughs> from, <laughs> from last before. winter. It's yep. the same one, it's back. And it's not to do with uh, not having a shot at the Gigi. It's about something much bigger. And it's about that hole. And then I realized I, 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 gotta, I gotta fix this. I gotta, I gotta figure this out. And part of it had to do with, you know, and, and, and I, how do you figure out to fix that hole? I don't know how to, I don't know how to figure that out. But I do know that, um, I do know that I have to stop um, I have to stop laying the responsibility for filling that with my work and I have to lighten up and I have to um, I have to be proud of what the work is and to let the work be what it is and to find the joy that I find in the work but I have to stop putting the responsibility of everything about me on the work right. and I have to find uh, I have to find a Robert Chafe in the world that's not about being a playwright because you know I, I, I'm, I, I'm even that with my family I've turned into that with my family that I'm walking down the street with my mom and mom will introduce me to someone and this is our playwright, she'll say. It's the first thing she'll say. It's like, which is great because she's proud and, and, and I get that and that's really lovely but uh, I, gotta, I gotta find somebody else in here because when the playwright fails or when something happens bad to the playwright, uh, it starts to, it, it's too crazy it's, it, because it's everything. Yes. So when, you know, when those things happen, like, everything is wrong it's 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 that's where that depression comes from so i got to figure out i haven't answered it yet but i, I at least now i know what it is <laughs> well, <laughs> I, need it's interesting. <laughs> I need a hobby i need to take up woodworking or something i don't know um, it's interesting <laughs> because i i contacted a few people and asked me uh -huh. questions and one was from jill and she said you could ask robert his fascination or his how why he writes so much about aloneness how he <laughs> hands a play and says well here's another play about, about aloneness. being alone right. so um 
Do you think that might be part of what what you feel when the playwright fails? That... Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess yes, for sure, for sure. You know, I, I you know, I'm not married. I'm a single guy, uh, and you know, yeah, I guess for yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I feel like that, I, I, true, I do write about that stuff an awful lot. Um, but I don't think I'm writing about it because, and I would certainly hope that the people who are in my life uh, don't see me this way. I don't think I'm preoccupied with loneliness. I don't think I... I, I, I don't I know, think I'm they not, do not, at all. I, I, no, I, because <laughs> actually, uh, Jill said, here's a fellow who's so, his social calendar is so full. She said, I consider him my best friend. There are several other people who uh, I know consider him their best friend. So I feel she, very loved. No, yeah. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> that's right. Um, so I was... But it, that's what I mean. Like, So I'm not preoccupied by loneliness, but but clearly I am, am artistically preoccupied by it. And I think it's psychologically uh, really um, interesting. And I would I would say that, I guess... The simple answer to that is that uh, my, my darkest moments, like I've had a pretty great life, right? Like um, I've had a pretty great life. I, had a, I have a tremendous family. I have a tremendous circle of friends. So that when I, when, I, when I do go to dark places, which I think what we all do as artists that we mine and that we, we, we want to explore, certainly for the drama, for, for, for the theater, a, a, a medium based upon conflict and drama, like you, you, you go to your dark places and and so my dark places are all about that, but I don't live in them. <laughs> so, but they are all about that, you know, and, uh, and, and so there are, you know, so there is, you know, the under wraps, which is that funny take on that, you know, that time of falling in love with that guy. And then there's belly up about, you know, being alone, this, this blind guy being alone after his mother dies, his sole caretaker dies and he's left alone. So, you know, they're really dark pieces. And, uh, and, you know, even after image, which is about a kid and a family, um, a, a full family, but his whole thing is is disconnect. That story came from Michael, but ultimately that was my in. I I, I understand that. I get that. Um, so I think I think that's what it is. I certainly think it's connected to the the the, the notion of of um, what's probably more what's probably more connected to to Jill's comment and that notion of there being an, an emptiness or a hole that has to be filled is that I, I guess I start to worry. Um, it goes back to that thing. I'm mo I'm more than just the playwright Robert right. Chafe. Well, I'm I'm more of a playwright than also just that guy who writes about loneliness. Right. And a bunch of people have said that, and I I totally get it, and they're totally justified in saying it, and um, I accept it and I embrace it, and uh, I'm really happy with that work. But um, I guess maybe if I do find that hobby woodworking, or I find that other aspect, the other Robert Chafe that that. Uh, that will take some pressure off this one. Um, that maybe the plays will change. Maybe what I'm writing about will change. You know, I do, as I stare down my life as what's coming, and this is now I'm going to get upset. <laughs> um, as I stare down my life of what's coming, uh, I worry about my parents. Yes, yeah. Oh, sorry. Whoa, that hit me hard. Uh, I worry about my parents. And in terms of dark places, I, I worry about that. Um, so the plays will change anyway. Yes. Uh, I won't be writing about unrequited love at 22 for the rest of my life. Right. Um, but I also, uh, you know, as I teach in university, whew, let me clear my eyes for a second. As I teach in university, I, you know, I, I'm trying to constantly talk to, uh, I always call them kids, even though some of them are older than me. I always talk to new playwrights about, you know, the difference between um, if you're writing a play and you're going to write a story or a narrative that's going to, to carry me, carry an audience through an hour, an hour and a half, two hours, the difference between that and writing a scene or writing a, a skit is the depth and, and, and the guts on the page and that and this is why this happens to me. Um, that you have to leave it you have to you know you have to to bring it and you have to be willing to bring it and you can't you can't ex i i get really frustrated by work on stage that feels inconsequential to the maker right i get really frustrated by that uh in many ways i guess i envy it that you can <laughs> that you can have a career and that you can do that and then you can create work and maybe it's not inconsequential to them and that's that's unfair of me to say but as as an audience member sometimes it feels completely inconsequential to the maker um, that this piece is happening. It's a, it's an idea. It's a folly. It's a thought, a wisp of a thought that goes through, 
Um, and I try to instill in these students, like, if you're going to do this and you want me to sit through it, you bring your guts and you throw it on stage. So these dark places I'm talking about and looking at, oh, what am I going to write about in 10 years? Well, that's why you're upset, because it's terrifying. It's terrifying.